Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. We understand everyone has probably uh, had Zoom fatigue at this point, and we really appreciate you entrusting the next hour with us. So I'm Brittany Blake. I am the Director of Marketing and Finance at LGA Architecture. And with me today is Jason Jajorian, who is the principal at LGA, and Alexia Chen, who is a project architect with us. When we look through the registration list, uh, we notice many of you are from different parts of the country and you may not be familiar with our firm or the work that we do. So I just wanted to take a couple minutes and introduce who it is we'll be speaking with uh, you today. So LG8 is a design firm from Las Vegas. We've been around over 30 years, and believe it or not, we do not do hospitality work. We specialize in projects that bring people together, so cultural institutions, museums, libraries, outdoor spaces, educational facilities. So um, some of our recent notable projects you may or may not be familiar with are the Springs Reserve, the Mob Museum, the Discovery Children's Museum, all of which are located here in Las Vegas all of which are award-winning projects. So if any of you guys are, are on the call today, hello and welcome. Uh, you can imagine a firm that, like us, that focuses on designing experiences and interactions with people, with each other and with the space and with nature. We have probably much like all of you spent our nights awake wondering what this new normal means for all of us and the future of the spaces that we design and love. And Jason's gonna get into a little bit about how this series came about and explain why we thought it could be beneficial for our clients. But I am just gonna go over a couple webinar logistics to get us started here. I'm sure all of you guys are so familiar with this by now, but I will just go quickly through this. You'll be muted throughout the presentation, so you don't have to worry about your dog barking. But uh, you will be able to communicate with us through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to submit a question at any time so uh, you don't have to try and remember what your thought was at the end. Uh, we will have some time to go over those at the end of the presentation. And we'll do as many as we can. Um, this presentation is being recorded, so uh, should you um, have to step away for a second or something, don't worry or, or miss a note. Uh, we will make this available for all of the attendees. And should you uh, not see that in your email uh, in the next couple days or so, please see the webinar link at the bottom of this screen, which will um, provide you with all of our previous uh, presentations, including this one. So I think with that, we're gonna go ahead and pass the mic to Jason. Thank you, Brittany. So welcome to new world, new experiences for our cultural institutions. I wanna give a little bit of background information into the creation of this webinar. And at the beginning of the quarantine period, we created a series that we called the Fireside Chats. And the Fireside Chats are a monthly series of where we bring in institutional leaders from our community and bring them together as panelists to connect with each other and connect with our community as a whole. And we found, you know, we, we needed to do something. This was our way of serving our community during this quarantine. And we learned from them, like all the things they're doing about how our institutions are planning for the future. Um, we, we've heard about some of their facility and operational changes they're making, to provide a safe environment to restore public trust and confidence. And what they're doing is they're really bridging the gap by developing new online content so they may continue their services. And many people on the call here today may have, may have done similar things. We've heard of this idea of the museum from home, and we've all most likely attended some cultural institutions online educational classes. These things are filling the social void the quarantine has left us. However, we heard loud and clear from our panelists and the community that in-person services or some level of in-person services are essential to our um, educational and um, social well-being. So as we reflect back on what we learned from the fireside chats, it led us to desire to think of ways our museums can improve flexibility and improve visitor experience in their spaces in the future. So let's begin with a positive vision of that future. What if 
we can work together to create safe and enjoyable visitor experiences that puts people at ease and makes them want to come back sooner than imaginable. What if we're able to return to our lives with renewed purpose and draw our community closer together? And what if in our new normal, we find innovative ways to live together and connect better with nature? None of us could have predicted this, this pandemic, pandemic. We are now in a need of, of a plan on how to adapt our facilities for the future while not losing what made our institutions great in the first place. At LGA, we believe the experience people have at our institutions are the key driver in producing happiness. We understand positive visitor experiences are the key for our institutions' long-term relevancy and success. So think, think of it this way. Think about your institution's bottom line. Providing a great visitor experience is the best marketing strategy there is. Word of mouth is the most effective tool to increase visitation, renew membership, raise value, raise volunteerism, and to address public and health, health safety concerns in our new world. This session is designed to offer ideas for adapting our facilities for flexibility and offer suggestions on how best to improve visitor experiences. In our new normal, we believe that the institutions that provide the best experiences for their patrons will be the institutions that bounce back the fastest and thrive. For today, we'll discuss three topics and under each topic on your screen now, you'll see the learning objectives for today. We'll discuss what makes a good visitor experience and the science behind that and how it will even more in the future. We'll tell stories of our past visitor experiences through examples and reimagine our future by weaving in stories of new possibilities. And finally, we'll offer some facility planning actions you may want to consider. So I'm going to turn it over to Alexia now, and she's going to talk a little bit about the role of healthy buildings in creating good visitor experiences. Hello. So, why does visitor experience matter? And what makes it a good experience? If we look into our memories for bad experiences, we can probably think of something such as arriving at a place like this. Let's see if the slides will progress. Give it a minute the feeling of being in this dark and wrong place, feeling unsafe, not sure where exactly to go because there are no signs for directions. All of this in, results in a bad impression and a bad memory. Now, if you try to remember one of the better experiences and what, what do they have in common? It may be a place like this that's welcoming, bright and open maybe even with windows for views outside. Or they might be signages to provide some clarity of where to go. Today, we will talk about some of these qualities that make up a good experience. They're not all necessarily new concepts, but it is now more important than ever to enhance your space when people might be hesitant to go out back into public places as we're still recovering from this pandemic. There are also many new challenges in this reality. For example, queuing like this is definitely a thing of the past. We now have to go through many safety procedures such as temperature checks, sanitizer stations, just to enter the facility. And people are gradually being required to wear masks. And there are distancing requirements. We all have to be cautious about touching surfaces and interacting with people. So how do cultural institutions enhance the visitor experience in this new normal and provide experiences that can relieve people's stress, engage their brains, provide that much missed social connection and save ways to explore the cultural offerings? One of the best ways to relieve stress and engage our brains is using healthy building principles. 
we take a look at this image. Um, we've all been in, in a conference room like this that's dark, windowless. It's usually hard to pay attention. And after being inside for a while, you just kind of feel restless and want to get out. And you may have seen some attempts in improving the windowless room by adding these artificial lighting panels that mimics the look of the sky. But a room like this with actual window that let in sunlight and provide views, a room where you can be near natural materials like wood or even have carpet like this that mimic the look of grass, it just simply makes you feel better. Even looking at a picture compared to the previous one made me feel better. I know I can have an all day workshop in this space and enjoy it because the space was designed with healthy building principles in mind. So why do we talk about healthy buildings? Because while human beings, while as human beings, we evolve out in, in nature, in modern society, we spend 90% of our time indoors. And cultural institutions are mostly indoor environments too. So how can we shape the indoor spaces to be more enjoyable and more engaging for your patrons so they stay longer and come back more frequently? We're going to talk about some of the key principles. As the previous example shows, we know we feel better in places with views and a connection to nature, um, places that have good indoor air quality, daylighting, and good acoustic performance. First of all, the value of clean air oops, is one of the hot topics right now due to the pandemic. This is a picture of a swan cooler filter. I want to tell you a story of, of mine when I was a graduate student. I attended a seminar in a rural location in Nevada. It was late August, like right now, and over 100 degrees. And there were about 30 of us crammed in a small room with only one swamp cooler and a couple of upright fans for air circulation. Despite how much I was interested in the topic presented by the panelists, I just couldn't stay awake. No matter how hard I tried, I struggled for hours to stay awake and listen, but it was just a terrible feeling and a terrible experience overall. Now thinking back on that, I realized the poor air quality and circulation was the main reason why I couldn't stay awake, because my brain needed some oxygen. We know from experience that we're more engaged and that when there's good indoor air and research also confirmed this. From this chart based on the Harvard study, we can see that when we reduce indoor air pollution, usually chemical off-gassing from materials such as carpet and paint and double the vent ventilation rate, the participants have better responses in the areas of focus and ability to use information, all of which potential of making a good visitor experience for the museums. And in order to achieve better quality air, there are some simple things we can do. We can increase outside air either by using operable windows or ventilation system controls to bring in more fresh air. We can use windows in public gathering spaces and ventilation controls in galleries that may require temperature and humidity control. And in the ongoing pandemic, you can also use better rated MERV for HEPA filters to further reduce transmission, ri transmission risks. And we can also keep the pollutants outside by using entry systems, walk-off mats and vestibules to trap the pollutants and the pathogens that may be on visitors' shoes from getting into your buildings. An equally important element of keeping people engaged is daylighting. This graphic shows how sunlight actually changes color throughout the day. And it is tied to our circadian rhythm, which is an internal biological clock that tells us when to be active and when to rest. The blue light keeps us awake while the red light allows us to relax. 
this is the reason why the new iPhones now have a night shift mode, allowing you to shift your screen color to be more red so you won't have problem falling asleep at night. And when people are engaged with cultural institutions such as museums, it's usually during the active part of the day with blue light. That's why you tend to feel more up and productive in a brightly daily space compared to a space with only artificial lighting and no window. Galleries with daylighting allow patrons to spend much more time in them. On the flip side, when you're in a dark and dimly lit space, you, your anxiety level naturally rises. Because when you can't see very well, you're also not sure if the place is very clean either in this pandemic, especially. As part of building, rebuilding the public trust, providing a bright daily space can help change that perception. And even when your exhibit spaces, the existing ones are not set up to have daylight, maybe providing some public areas that they live for brace can help re-energize the visitors before they continue with the exploration. In this example, not only does the window bring light, it also provides a view to nature, which brings us to the next point, our love for nature and how it improves our mental well-being. There's a reason why we always see photos of nature in doctor's offices. And the same reason why people would pay more for hotel rooms with views to nature over those with city or parking lot views. We love to look at nature, like this beautiful photo, to observe its beauty because it just makes us feel better. And it's relaxing when we let our minds free to explore this view. And since we all have been quarantined at home for the last five months or so, I'm sure you can all relate to the feeling when you just need to go outside for a short walk Take a look at the trees and the greenery, the sky, and maybe listen to the birds for a while. It makes you feel better after being cooped up all day in your home office. And if you look around the room you're sitting in right now, the walls, the ceiling, and the furniture, and compared to this picture, all the man-made elements, they just lack the same richness and complexity that nature has to offer. And this is why I always use a ocean scene or other, other pictures in my Zoom background because I rather look at a more re relaxing view and dream about vacation instead of my drywall and bathroom door when I have Zoom meetings. So the concept behind this is called attention restoration theory. The changing colors and the layer of textures the, the smell of plants, the sound of water, they all help relax and clear our minds by providing a soft fascination. It allows our minds to wander a bit and help us recover from the mental fatigue and renew our attention and focus. While it is still stressful to be going out in the public health crisis, if we can incorporate views and access to nature and built spaces, it will help reduce anxiety and improve the experience for visitors and staff alike. One more thing that's often overlooked is the acoustical experience of your space. A poor acoustical experience could stem from having too much echoes, loud mechanical AC noises, or the lack of any noise whatsoever, the uncomfortable silence that we all know. While each one results in a very different experience, they all have something in common, which is being a distraction to the activities at hand. The impact can actually be up to a 40% drop in our cognitive performance. And once we're distracted, it takes us on average 23 minutes to re-engage with what we were doing before. For museum visitors, this could mean missing an entire gallery of exhibits and information. As we discussed before, natural views help our brains relax and refocus. The same effect is found with natural ambient sound. So let's take a little break here and listen to a clip.
he then takes your eyes and imagine to his dreams. How does everyone feel? I can't hear you, but feel free to leave comments in the chat. Did you feel better? More awake maybe for this morning? Did you know that research shows that the sound of spring water, what we just listened to, has the most cognitive benefits because revolutionarily, calm moving water means there's security of survival with safe drinking water. And that's why our brains can relax when it hears the sound. This doesn't mean that you have to play water sounds in every one of your galleries, but perhaps consider incorporating natural sounds in the in-between spaces, the elevator lobbies, circulation stairs, or the other waiting areas in the museum. So the visitor can use a moment of break and recharge before moving on to other parts of the museum. If you have a natural history museum, it could be fun to imagine what nature sounded like in a certain era and time. And if natural sounds may not be entirely appropriate, consider using other recordings that may make sense in the historical and cultural background, just to create an engaging acoustic environment for your guests. To summarize, Healthy buildings enhance the visitor's experience by allowing their brains to be more relaxed and engaged. And engaged patrons tend to come back to your places more often. <clears throat> With the stress of reopening and the need to rebuild that public trust, visitors will choose to go back if they can feel safe to explore in your space. And let's not forget, healthy buildings can also help engage your staff. Your staff accounts for up to 90% of your operational cost. And with the higher budgets we now have to deal with, it's an important aspect to consider. This picture in the background of the slide is one of the many medical offices we designed. Out of over 50 prototype offices with similar layouts and the same materials, this is the most loved one, and mainly because this access to the lake view outside. It has been a great recruitment tool for the client as both incoming and existing staff wanted to work at this place. In the new world, beyond keeping the staff physically safe with cleaning and disinfecting protocols, it is important to maintain their morale and well being, and a healthy building can keep your staff happy and effective. Now, Jason is going to talk to us about the other aspects of creating a great experience. Thank you, Alexia. There we go. <laughs> so let's reimagine future visit experiences by using our adroit process. We adopted the adroit process from exhibit planners, but we made our own over the years. The adroit is a framework for designing unique visitor experiences. And each letter of the adroit represents a step within a patron's visit. The A in adroit is for arrival. The D step is for decompression. The R is for reception. The O is for orientation. I is for interpretation. And finally, T is for transformation. And we like to think about every part of the user's journey to maximize the overall engagement. And we believe that looking at these details makes for a better overall great experience that will drive your bottom line. Now, in light of uh, the pandemic, current pandemic, we realized a step was missing and that is the pre-arrival step. So let's start there uh, as, as a beginning. The pre-arrival step is, is truly your online virtual presence and engagement. And here you can manage expectations to provide clarity to your patrons before they come or come back to your facility. We've seen examples of 
uh, the posting of the best times to visit, maybe when the occupancy is lower than other times to keep numbers down in your facility. We've seen portals to purchase online tickets to reduce contact when visitors do come to your facility or the wait times. We've seen the posting of cleaning schedules and to help ensure and provide some public trust in that you're taking care of your facility. This also allows you to post uh, the procedures and new protocols you would like your patrons to follow once they arrive to help manage and curb the behavior. And you wanna focus on the things that they can do and what new upgrade experiences you now offer. Alexia talked a lot about the importance of indoor air quality. And this is a growing trend and we, we see this going on now and uh, people are starting to ask that question. I mean, we in the past may have looked on our phones at the weather app and seen the outdoor air quality, but now we know and we're starting to become more aware of that indoor built environment and that indoor quality is just as important. So maybe use your website as a way to post and be transparent with those indoor air quality readings. People are looking for that now and this, this is gonna be a trend that we're gonna see. Let's move to the arrival step. The arrival is where we can begin on, we begin on the exterior and we wanna focus on creating a welcoming and safe place. Beauty here is in the details. At the Springs Reserve in Las Vegas, the solar panel structure and the native trees help provide extra shade for people once, once they arrive. And this is important because we want to avoid long queuing lines. And um, now there's more staggered entrances or staggered times people are entering facilities. So we want to make them feel comfortable. In addition, this is the Springs Reserve. So the story of water is of the utmost importance. And here, those details of how to manage stormwater or handle, handle the authentic, it's the authentic way of handling those. Sorry. <laughs> um, the, so the telling the story of water, the the zero curves in the parking area allows the water to drain in these natural swells. And visitors, as they make their way to the visitor center, can encounter these swells and, and, and feel that experience. In the future, providing better drop-off experiences that connect people to comfortable exterior spaces becomes even more important. You want to make visitors feel safe and comfortable. And sometimes you do this by just providing visible and clear signage that provides clarity and identity. And you wanna provide easy access for all. Parents can roll and easily roll their strollers over the zero curve here, and there's activities for the children to go to once they arrive. The concrete blocks you see in the picture here are uh, provide protection uh, from cars for your visitors. But at the same time, they're, they provide a place for people to sit and socialize at a safe distance. We found the introduction of public art into our rival uh, steps can help activate spaces and be part of what helps bring social connections back. You know, public art serves as a great photo opportunity and a good experience there. In addition, art can play a, a role in bringing awareness to the state of our world, such as the issues around climate change or in helping us find a better way in how we can understand each other in the future. Children from the school nearby in Mountain's Edge Park um, created the artwork on the tiles that's embedded into this concrete wall. And we learned of this technique from the Laughlin Library design we did uh, decades ago. Um, during construction of that project, children from the neighborhood were able to come and place their handprints on a plaster column that's central to the youth space. And last year we attended a 30 year anniversary of that grand opening. And it's amazing to hear the stories and the pride the community still has in that one particular event. So in inclusion is another way to, to bring uh, connections and good experiences. In the past, uh, the Baker Pool and Park, uh, the pool itself was hidden from view and, and now it's identified with messaging. Before, Many people in the neighborhood didn't even know the pool existed. Now, now it's a good place for them to, to enjoy the water. You want to make people feel comfortable by telling them what they could do and not focus on restrictions. Here's another example at the Warren Springs Natural Area. Um, this site was also fairly hidden in the past, and now it's identified with new branded signage that uh, the brand carries its way through the whole experience. 
Use this positive messaging to build trust. And here's a couple other great examples we found. It's okay to enjoy the grass, enjoy yourself and relax. And sometimes you have a peak experience and you want your patrons to, to just sit back and enjoy it, not worry about anything else. Now to decompression, and this is a transitional step. We like to carry over the theme from arrival and connect people to the reception space. The goal is to relieve stress and have your visitors leave their worries behind by providing accommodations. At the Railroad Museum Visitor Center, the elevated plaza you see here becomes the outdoor transitional space before people enter the visitor center. And this plaza is highlighted by the Davenport locomotive. And the Davenport has a great story to tell. It was a locomotive that brought materials down to Hoover Dam during construction. So the point here is to bring your interior offerings to the exterior as much as possible to expand your people spaces. Here's at this nature center is an example of a clear path that relieves stress in a subtle way. It begins with an information panel and the winding path leads visitors on. The path has purposely cracked concrete edges to reflect the geological nature of the place. Fox, jackrabbit, bighorn sheep, animal tracks and those impressions are pressed into the concrete. And they all follow a stream of embedded glass that leads visitors on to the reception space. These clues provide clarity and insight to what visitor to a visitor may experience when exploring the land beyond the visitor center. And now uh, to the, the reception. And the reception is a formal introduction of the experience. The goal here is to provide visitors additional assurance and of their safety and direction on how to proceed exploring the facility. At this Railroad Museum Visitor Center, the ticket space is positioned in a clear and visible way. And it's a safe distance for people entering. And the staff here, employees can direct people as they enter facility and, and provide that direction and, and comfort. The interior planters here can create the potential for one-way directional pass. And this uh, to the right of the, of the uh, ticket space is the interactive dashboard that can show real-time operational changes. Last year, we had an office meeting and we, we brought up the question, uh, what's the best qualities of a good reception space? And to the, to the forefront, natural light and well-lit spaces came to the top. And this is especially true at Opportunity Village and their clients have a higher eye sensitivity to light than most people. And I think most of us experience something similar to this. If you may have walked out from an exterior uh, well-lit space and walked into a poorly lit restaurant and how uncomfortable it feels for your eyes to adjust to that low level. So the point is to make stronger connections and more seamless connections from exterior spaces to interior spaces. In the future, uh, we see a need for new considerations for visitors entering your facility. Um, one idea is to have larger vestibule spaces um, where people can be screened and personal protection equipment can be distributed when necessary, but also it allows for larger walk-off mats. So your patrons can clear the contaminants off their shoes before they come into your facility and bring those contaminants in. And here in the picture here is an example of a safe room. This is a comfortable space for consultation. And this may be necessary an idea of how to handle patrons or visitors who have some amount of emotional stress when they arrive. Orientation is about providing clear, reliable direction. And that is the key in this step to reduce visitor anxiety and decrease confusion. Orientation is about providing comfort and guidance to visitors throughout an organized framework. At the Discovery Children's Museum in Las Vegas, each level is themed. The first level is about geology. The second level is about flora and fauna. And the third level, which you're looking at here, is, the, is about the atmosphere. And those things play out in the color and material, materials and texture used and the ceiling cloud shapes above. Each level has an orientation center near the central staircase. And here the programmable panels can help user, users feel at ease with options on where they can go.
In the future, direct guidance and real-time facility updates can be sent directly to displays such as this or to personal mobile devi devices. Back at Opportunity Village, uh, there is a central landmark tree. It's in, within the space. And this helps patrons and visitors understand where they are in relationship to this landmark. The tree provides a direct connection to nature and Opportunity Village decorates this tree to help with some social connections. Uh, seasonally, they decorate it. This is a place where people, people can gather socially and the landmark itself can also serve as a, a marker for separation of spaces when necessary. Now to interpretation. The interpretation experiences can take many forms. This is a step where learning happens and connections are made. At the Springs Reserve Des Desert Living Center, you'll find these passive solar and ventilation building strategy details around the buildings. And these are visual cues become conversation starters and bring people together in an unexpected way. Alexia told me how this actually happened to her, the exact same thing. And she overheard a couple talking about one of these details. And she was able to introduce herself to them and make a connection to them. Right outside the Spring Mountain Visitor Gateway is the Seven Stone Plaza. And the Seven Stone Plaza it celebrates the indigenous Southern Paiute tribes known collectively as the Nuuvi people. This place allows tribal members to come together to tell stories and be connected to a place of meaning to them. So this is an example of an outdoor classroom setting. Capture as much outdoor space as possible to expand services and connect to nature. And we may have heard this idea about hybrid models, hybrid experiences. Um, and what that is, is it's the combination of online virtual uh, experiences with in-person experiences. We know the virtual world, we're not completely replace hands-on or the need for hands-on, but we do see a movement towards more hand-free interactions, um, such as motion sensors and voice command activated devices and displays. I think we've all now seen examples of personal styluses or even theme styluses that can replace finger touching on commonly placed devices. However, we see a huge potential in the virtual world. We can connect our institutions to a much larger audience. We can imagine a person anywhere in the world who may virtually walk through your museum and experience all of your exhibits from the comfort of their own home. The transformation is the final step. So transformation doesn't always relate to a particular space. However, it is the ultimate experience and delivery of an institution's purpose. Each transformation is unique to its own time and specific to its own time and place. So what was once a filled golf course and skating ring at the Spring Mountain Visitor Gateway is now a place to self-reflect, connect to nature, connect to the history of the Weavey people, and connect to the mountain. What used to be a parking lot at the Alexander Dawson School is a garden where school children can participate in growing the food that they eat in the cafeteria. The chef highlights the garden vegetables used on the med menu. And in some cases, this experience opens a door to a lifetime of healthy living. So institutions that best connect with their visitors through positive experiences will embed long lasting memories that secure the institution's place in the future. We introduced the role of healthy buildings in visitor experiences and gave examples using our Adroit tool. So now we're left with the question. What transformations does your facility make happen and how can you make those experiences even better? So I'm gonna turn it over to Alexia now and she'll close and guide you through the planning actions you may wanna consider. Thanks, Jason. So we just heard from Jason, some reimagined experiences that cultural institutions can offer, but how does it apply to your facilities? The Adroit tool can be used to review your current patron experience one step at a time. To find strengths that can be enhanced and weaknesses to be improved. We've gone back and reviewed some of our own projects using the Adroit audit and learned many things, but one for example, that there can never be enough signage. 
I mean, we've all seen those permanently temporary signs that are printed out of letter-sized paper everywhere. And with all the changes that come with COVID, attention to wayfinding and communication is extremely crucial. It is also important to customize space planning to suit your scenario plans as the situation continues to evolve. You want to adapt the facility to follow your operational needs. And with tighter budgets, what are some cost-effective options that can be done? What if you have a small lobby, not enough space for people to be safely distanced as they enter? How about dressing up an outdoor waiting area with plants and shade using planter to separate traffic flows? You can also easily incorporate natural sounds inside a lobby to provide some calmness and mindfulness for patrons as they go through the otherwise stressful check-in process. What if you have a dark meeting room with no opportunities for windows? You can add a few tubular skylights to bring in daylight in a cost-effective and energy-efficient way. And your existing event spaces may be too small for groups to gather and have classes. But if you have some outdoor spaces, it can be adapted for not only exhibit, but also group events such as workshop and classes. We have heard some museums repurpose their larger traveling exhibit space to host group activities. And what if you're in the middle of planning a new building or major renovations? You might want to envision some new approaches to space design that will maximize flexibility and safety in the new normal. You may opt for reconfigurable walls and furnishings instead of permanently built-in fixtures. You will need surfaces and spaces that are easy to clean and a more advanced ventilation system and controls. You may even reconsider the ratio of indoor-outdoor spaces in the new plan. We know it is hard to predict the future, but these are some methods for you to think about when making new plans. Organizations adapt to survive in crisis. Museums have created online programs and virtual tours and we heard that many of the projected future museum trends have now become part of your everyday reality. Not only do we have the acceleration of new approaches, there also will be some lasting changes in people's behavior, being more cognizant of indoor air quality, their contact with surfaces, and the perception of size and cleanliness of the spaces they're in. As our new normal, continues to extend its day, the pandemic may have permanently altered people's expectations when they visit a museum. What we discussed today, the healthy building principles and the method for experience planning may be the keys to ensuring continued trust and positive feedback from the public. We hope that this presentation has inspired you to think differently about your buildings and if you'd like to learn more about how to apply these concepts and processes, please reach out to us. We can provide an experience audit or healthy building audit to determine what you might need to do to update your facilities. We can help you transition and transform your space into a safer and more engaging environment for the future. Thank you very much for joining us today. And we now have some time for questions. Hopefully you put some questions down in the Q and A. I don't know, Brittany has been monitoring it for us. Yes, I actually had a couple sent to me. I'll wait for any other that may come through here, but I got a couple directly to me here. I see Danielle uh, from HEI is uh, posting that they actually perform some of these things um, on the MEP side. So hello, Danielle. But um, I, let's see here, I'll, I'll read this first one to you. I have a limited budget, which I've spent mostly on cleaning, disinfecting, and PPE for my staff. What can I do to get the most bang for my buck with limited funds? Who wants to take that one? Take it. <laughs> I'll take a stab. Um, well, there are certain things that we're seeing now, and if it's related to 
you know, providing a better indoor space, uh, simply getting a air quality monitor, um, those are relatively cheap now on, on the market, can help you understand the type of air quality in your space and how to make adjustments. Uh, sometimes it simply is bringing a little bit more outside air, opening the window or doing some other steps once you understand where you're at. Um, in terms of other experiences, uh, sometimes um, a little, changing out lights to LED fixtures, better light quality, um, opening up shades, trying to get more indoor air, uh, indoor light into spaces is, is important. And if you have a little bit of funds, uh, one of the most impactful things we found as uh, designers is signage and just direction on, and that really helps the overall experience. Anything to add, Alexia? Yeah, I think there, um, we talked about a lot of things and there's potentially a lot of things you can do to your space, but I think, you know, a, a thorough evaluation will be very helpful for you to kind of identify what are the, um, the major areas that you make the most impact with and then focus your funds and effort on upgrading those aspects. You don't have to do everything, but if you can do two or three things that have the, uh, the, the right impact and then it will change the perception in space. This one is clearly asked by um, somebody in the design world, um, but I will read it here. In response to social distancing requirements, do you think that we will see codified changes to the IBC's maximum floor area allowances per occupant, particularly in assembly group A3, which is museums, art galleries, <laughs> libraries, and oh. <laughs> exhibition halls. Very yeah, so, specific there. Yeah, we, we haven't seen anything yet, but we do believe there's there'll probably be a trend. Um, it's funny, like if you just take it in office spaces, uh, the old trend was offices, separate offices, now I'm squeezing office space to smaller spaces and maybe a cubicle format. And now there's a movement back to separating people. So um, will it be codified? I, I think there's a potential for that. But I think as uh, experienced designers, we, we do want to allow space where people gather, um, regardless of the code minimums or not. You want to have space where people feel comfortable, such as uh, small elevator lobbies. We want to open those spaces up. We want to open up to spaces around reception areas or uh, where people enter, just to pe make people feel comfortable. Yeah, it's interesting. I think most of the these code required occupancy is more for uh, exiting situation in emergency, but you know the code gets revised every two years, so it'd be interesting to see how the pandemic plays out if, if people pro propose changes to it in the in the next four to six years, maybe. Very good. This one is near and dear to my heart as a, uh, a self-certified naturopath. No, uh, this is <laughs> this is regarding um, harsh chemicals um, and incessant cleaning um, and balancing that with um, our thoughts and LGA's uh, practice of healthy buildings and how how do you guys propose that those two can work together? Um, so I think the concern is with some of the chemicals and what they, you know, what, how, what, 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 what's the ingredients that's all in these cleaning supplies. You know, there's probably a long list of items on the CDC's list, and most of us can't read those chemical names and we don't really know what they are. And uh, so I think if that's a concern, uh, that the most basic cleaning um, would be, you know, obviously this would depend on what I don't, what things you're cleaning, but soap and water is very useful still, if you can use that. Um, just need to make sure there's long enough time and, you know, it creates the soot. Um, uh, alcohol solutions would be another way to clean it. Um, you know, the alcohol, alcohol will evaporate and there should be nothing in the air that will cause any issues. And then if you're okay with bleach, the bleach solution is another option. And then I think one of the things I heard from the CDC discussion was that you really want to focus your cleaning on the area that's the most touched and had high traffic. So you don't have to be necessarily cleaning the floor as much as you clean the door handles, but you definitely want to spend most of your efforts on the, on the things that people pass by and definitely come in contact with. So that, that would be my recommendation. 
All right, that was the only questions that I had submitted here. So uh, I don't know who wanted to wrap it up, but if you want it to be- Craig in the comments says, also you can use UV to disinfect. That's a, that's a good one. So I think um, that's something if you have the budget, I know schools in China have done this. They install UV lights in the classrooms, which they would turn on after everybody leaves at the end of the day and have it disinfect the room overnight. So, uh, so UV is definitely another uh, option. Um, you just need to make sure that it's, it's being utilized when people are not there and then there's enough time of exposure for it to actually disinfect the space. 